Welcome to ACS Webinars, bringing you the best and brightest minds in chemistry live every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. To view our upcoming schedule, please visit acs.org slash acswebinars. Welcome everybody. Today we want to talk about 3D printing. And really the paradigm is how we tackle this rapidly emerging technology from a molecules and manufacturing standpoint. And that's really the paradigm and what we want to describe today. So together, myself, Tim Long, I'm the director of the Macromolecules Interfaces Institute at Virginia Tech, and my colleague Chris Williams, who's the associate director and also a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. We're going to describe this kind of molecules to manufacturing scenario to you. I'm a polymer chemist, and really the power of 3D printing resides at the interface of chemistry, but also engineering. And fortunately, I have a good colleague, Chris Williams, in mechanical engineering, who's the director of a dreams lab. And he'll tell you about a lot of the emerging platforms and tools where chemistry and these engineering tools are coming together at a rapid pace. So with that, I'm going to let Chris give you kind of a sense of the literature and the buzz that's happening around the world. Thanks, Tim. So yeah, as we've seen, there's been a tremendous amount of excitement lately in the areas of additive manufacturing. And the question, you know, will 3D printing change the way that we use and consume products? And there are a lot of reasons to be excited about additive manufacturing, whether it's an opportunity to democratize manufacturing, the opportunity to completely change the way that we consume and produce and distribute products, or really just the opportunities in new product designs, the new types of shapes and complex geometries that can be created, and with it, the new functionalities. Some examples include custom-made prosthetics for small children and even large volume production of custom-fitting devices like custom-fit hearing aids or custom-fit orthodontics made by Align Technologies. And you know, these not just engineering polymers, we can also produce metals and other biomaterials. So as you see on the next slide, you'll see that we're even starting to print organs and ductwork for aircraft and even entire small UAVs. The opportunities are, as Tim mentioned, at this intersection between materials and manufacturing. And that's a critical need for added to manufacturing. And as you see on this following slide, the real opportunities that exist at the intersection of science and engineering are in the creation of a larger catalog of working materials. So although this technology has been in existence for over 30 years, there are really only a limited set of materials that are currently processed. And there's even a limited understanding of how the machines and the materials interact. And that's really the opportunity that exists for this community. So just to follow a little bit on what Chris is talking about, these opportunities for this community involve new materials. And if we look at it from a real fundamental chemistry standpoint, we can start to think about, you know, what are some of the real key avenues for research and development? So for example, tailoring rheology or the study of flow, how do we look at viscosity in a different way for additive manufacturing? And then with that, marry new molecular structures. How do we correlate molecular structure with flow? And that flow is unique to the tools that Chris and others are developing, so we need to understand that interface. Also, when we look at 3D printing, as you're going to learn today, we're going to talk about structures that are created in a layer-by-layer -layer fashion. What are the intermolecular interactions that we have to worry about in between each of those 25 micron layers, for example? What about the surfaces? What about different interfacial phenomena and how that may influence physical properties of these layered architectures? And then superimposed on all this really fundamental chemistry understanding, how do we develop new orthogonal synthetic methods? And orthogonal means, hey, if I have one chemical reaction happening in one step, it's fairly inert in another step. So it kind of goes along for the ride. And that's the kind of compartmentalized synthetic chemistry right, that we're going to need to develop for these future additive manufacturing tools. So as Chris has mentioned, really, this is a molecules to manufacturing scenario. This is where the opportunities lie. So not only are we doing synthesis and analysis of materials, but once these are manufactured in an additive manufacturing tool, how do we analyze those products? What new types of analytical tools do we need? Do we really expect the properties of 3D printed materials to be the same as the physical properties for an injection mold material? You know, we think the answer is no. So how do we develop those product requirements? And how do we use novel polymer chemistry, part geometry, and new manufacturing processes together in a very integrated way? So from a chemistry standpoint, some of the things we'll be touching on today are listed on this slide. These are called parameters. And the parameters are things that we as chemists can change. Molecular weight and molecular weight distribution, composition, stereochemistry. 
morphology or the study of structure, topology, the study of the molecular shape, and rheology, the study of flow. And then in addition to these somewhat obvious parameters, what about the surface features, the surface topology, the surface chemistry, and what additives can we add to a 3D printed part that might impart some type of smart functionality? So the ones I have in red are the ones that we're going to focus on. We're going to talk a lot about chemical composition, what's being used and what can we imagine for the future. Morphology, you know, we're going to be talking about extrusion. How does that influence morphology and how does that interrelate? And then finally, rheology, as we mentioned, the study of flow. Things have to move in the 3D printer. Molecules have to undergo shear forces. So how do we handle that and how do we understand that from a fundamental kind of science and engineering perspective? So the webinar outline today, Chris is going to give you an additive manufacturing overview. He's going to kind of get you excited about the different tools that are available. We're going to be talking about additive manufacturing materials, and we're going to focus on extrusion, photopolymerization, and then just a little vignette on powder bed fusion and binder jetting. And then we'll give a summary as to what maybe the future might hold, some key takeaways you know, that you might want to think about. So Chris, I'll turn this slide to you. Yeah, so in the additive manufacturing, we always start with a three-dimensional solid model of the shape that we want to create. And that model is either created by a CAD software or via 3D scanning. And of course, what we're trying to get is the physical representation, the printed object of that model. And the way that we get there is we first sort of compress that file, the CAD model, into the STL file, basically the standard file format for printing. Think about it like an MP3 or a PDF, right? a compressed way to share information. That model is then sliced into several cross-sectional layers. We pass each layer to the printer one at a time, starting from the bottom and working our way to the top. And as you see in the animation, we've basically been doing layered fabrication for a very long time. It's an analog to essentially like topographical maps where we try to represent a complex contour in 3D space by basically cutting sections and stacking them one on top of the other. And you'll hear that we keep using the word additive manufacturing as opposed to 3D printing. Additive manufacturing is the ASTM standard terminology, and it's chosen because it's clearly differentiated against the traditional subtractive manufacturing technology. So we're not taking a big chunk of material and slowly cutting away what we don't want. Instead, in additive manufacturing, we're selectively adding material precisely where we do want it. And from an engineering standpoint, that opens up a whole new design space in which we can work. And in a chemistry standpoint, we now actually, in some printers, are able to actually put specific multiple materials in specific locations throughout the volume. Now, there are lots of different ways to do additive manufacturing. In fact, there are seven classified techniques for printing an object layer by layer from the bottom up. And they all follow the exact same procedure. The only difference is the way in which they create that layer. As Tim mentioned, we're going to go through about four technologies today, and we're going to start with the one that probably most of you are most familiar with, which is called material extrusion. So as you see on the following slide, in material extrusion, we're basically melting a polymer through a extrusion nozzle. Think about a robotic hot glue gun. We are melting the material and extruding one layer by drawing the print head in an XY pattern, and then we can actually go to the next layer by moving the elevator, the Z stage, up and down. And it allows us to basically essentially grow the part layer by layer. So actually in this video, you actually see this happening. And, and it's a, a sped up version of the video. And it's building, of course, our university mascot. And you're seeing two materials being deposited. The white material is actually ABS, which is the rigid polymer that we are using. And then the brown material is actually a sacrificial material that's supporting complex shapes like overhangs and providing fixturing the part as it's being printed. That brown material is later washed away. It's a soluble material, actually a soap derivative, and that's how you get your finished product. The key part of the processing is this melt state. Basically what we're doing is providing heat to induce polymer flow, and most of the materials commercially that we work with are amorphous polymers. We have to go above the glass transition temperature to get the material to flow. We can't overheat because we don't want to degrade the polymer, and of course we also don't want it to ooze everywhere, so it has to be sort of softened. We want the material to extrude and then hold some rigidity such that we can, it will remain where it is the next time we come to the following layer. The other thing though is we don't want this material to cool quickly because then it will start to shrink and warp. And of course every time we print in a layered context, we want that layer to be there when we come back. But of course we want it to be softened so we want the layers to bond and so that we don't get delamination. And actually we process the material in a sort of heated oven typically and that way that allows us to sort of 
keep the material at a constant temperature, and once the print is completed, we then slowly cool down to room temperature, effectively annealing the part to prevent shrinking and out-of-plane warping. So Tim, if you don't mind, share with us some of the other materials that we can process in extrusion. Well, if you look at the list on this slide, it's, it's somewhat limited. That's my first glance as a chemist, is, is that this is a relatively small group of molecular structures that are currently being used. And Chris specifically mentioned the acrylonitrile butadiene styrene, kind of the first molecule, the first chemical structure in the top of this table. It's a copolymer made by chain growth polymerization. It's known for high toughness and great impact resistance. But really, any thermoplastic material, if it has the right melt viscosity, is going to be suitable for this extrusion process. Now, Chris used the term thermoplastic in one of his earlier slides. And what does that mean? Well, thermoplastic is something that can be processed, right? It's plastic. It's processable. It has plasticity with the application of thermo or heat. So ABS is a great example of a thermoplastic that can be molded and, in fact, remolded. You know, upon heating. So many of the 3D printed parts could, in fact, be re-extruded or re reused after they're used one time. Polysulfones are a high-performance engineering thermoplastic. They have glass transition temperatures near 180 degrees C, as high as 220 degrees C, and they're chemically and thermally stable, very good dimensional stability. They're optically clear. They have absolutely beautiful optical properties. They're made by Solve down near Atlanta and they're a great material of choice. Also polycarbonates, we all know from DVDs and, and CDs, this is a material with excellent optical clarity, it has very good processability with a wide range of viscosity, it has a glass transition temperature about 145, and has very good mechanical properties, particularly impact properties. And then polyether imids, certainly a material of choice for NASA and other high performance engineering kind of applications. Polyimids, certainly the, the leader in the United States would be Sabic. They're located up in, in Mount Vernon. And they're really high glass transition temperature polymers, similar to polyether ether ketone or PEAK. These are high performance thermoplastics that are suitable in 3D printing. And then finally, polyesters. In fact, here's a polyester. It has a low glass transition temperature. They're often recognized as being biocompatible, biodegradable. And in fact, Eastman Chemical Company in Kingsport, Tennessee recently released a polyester specifically designed for additive manufacturing. So companies are starting to look at this and realize the potential power of coming up with a new product specifically geared towards this future manufacturing tools. So if we mention the word thermoplastic, I kind of want to reinforce the fact that the polymers that we showed in the previous slide and that Chris has mentioned they're processable with the application of heat, and they're thermally stable, of course, if we use the right temperatures, and they have the right viscosities. And these polymers can be semi-crystalline, as you see in the middle cartoon, where parts of the chain, right, for example, in a nylon or crystalline, those high melting point segments impart a lot of nice physical cross-linking, good chemical resistance, very good mechanical and wear characteristics. If you're trying to 3D print a part that's going to see a lot of mechanical forces on the surface, these are going to have great properties for that. Also, people are extruding amorphous polymers. So amorphous polymers like ABS only has a glass transition temperature, does not have a melting point. But in either case, in the melt extrusion process, you need to be above the highest transition temperature. So in the case of an amorphous polymer, you're well above the TG. In the cases of a semi-crystalline polymer, you're typically about 25 degrees C above that melting point. We also have to, as chemists, think about rheology. This is not something that chemists normally think about. This is normally reserved to an engineering laboratory, but in reality, this has come into the chemistry field because we need to know how molecules respond to force. And there's a very strong correlation between molecular structure and rheology. So for example, viscosity, which we see in this plot on the right as a function of frequency or shear rate, the viscosity is going to increase as molecular weight increases. And that kind of maybe seems obvious to you, but we have to kind of balance processability with mechanical properties and other performance types of criteria. And this image on the left is a very common rheometer manufactured by TA Instruments. It's one we have in our laboratory, and it's well suited for these experiments. So on this slide, this really represents the kind of the Achilles heel or the double-edged sword of what we're trying to accomplish. And that's one you want to get a property versus molecular weight profile where you're up where that plateau is in that solid line. You want to be up where the property is somewhat stable and not changing. But as we increase molecular weight, the other y-axis on the right-hand side of this plot shows a very steep dotted line going up kind of towards the ceiling, right, going straight up to the top of the page. 
at a very strong power, almost a cubic power scaling relationship. So the viscosity is scaling to the 3.4 power, and that viscosity obviously is not going to be desirable for some type of 3D printing or extrusion application. So making sure that you balance physical properties with rheology is one of the important questions that Chris and I and others are trying to address. So in extrusion, it's not just about processing thermoplastics. There are a lot of other types of materials that one could process. One example is a filled thermoplastic. In this case, some work recently released by Oak Ridge National Labs where they're putting carbon fiber, short fiber, into an engineering polymer. But in addition, you can also, for example, print extrude concrete to maybe one day print homes, like that's been done by Dr. Koshinevis at University of Southern California. Also, you can start printing some biomaterials, some cell gels, or even cells themselves to actually start fabricating organs or biological tissue. Another recent work done in our lab is the idea of extruding a conductive paste, essentially a nano-silver paste that allows you to actually directly print circuits into parts so that you can start printing circuits and sensors into your parts as they're being fabricated. Extrusion is just one of the technologies in added to manufacturing. Another way to form layers in a layer-wise fashion is through the technique of photopolymerization, essentially taking a photopolymer and selectively curing it with UV light. Stereolithography was the first ever technology commercialized in the 3D printing space by 3D Systems, Chuck Hole in 1983. And then the idea here is to use a UV laser and to scan that laser across the surface of a photopolymer vat using two scanning mirrors. And essentially, wherever that laser touches, we start to cure that photopolymer uh, to essentially draw the layer. And once the layer is complete, the elevator dips down into the resin vat, and then you cure the next layer and solidify it into the previous layer to actually create your final part. Right now, the most common use of that technology is actually to make patterns for investment casting. Now, instead of using a laser, you can also just use essentially a projector to selectively mask your light, project in the image of the layer, layer by layer. And as Tim starts the video here, you can actually see well, this is a system that we built at, at Virginia Tech. It's allowing us to project light down to about 30 microns in feature size. And if you look carefully, you sort of see this pattern. That's actually a honeycomb shape that we're patterning layer by layer to create a tissue scaffold geometry. So it's dipping into the resin vat and then selectively cured with UV light. And you can see some results of our work in the bottom left there, some really high feature resolution. Now, beyond vat photopolymerization, essentially, again, doing photopolymerization of vat of resin, you can also really selectively jet the material. So think about an inkjet printer where you're jetting 30 micron droplets of resin, and on that print head is mounted a UV lamp that as it's printing back and forth, that UV lamp is giving the energy required to fully cure the material. And the unique properties of this technology are that it's a very high resolution machine, but also can print multiple materials at the same time. So as you see in the following animations, you'll see you know, black material next to white material. And in this case, that white material is stiff and the black material is flexible. And as Tim starts the animation in the bottom right, this is actually a part that was printed. And as we printed it, we actually embedded a wire. And this finger came off the printer as one single piece. It has both stiff bones and flexible joints. The idea that maybe one day we could hopefully print a robot that crawled right off the printer by itself. But an opportunity as a chemist to basically mix materials. And here's a quick video showing you the printer in action. Basically, you can see the print head moving back and forth. This is a high-speed video. And you can see the UV lamp at the leading edge curing the resin and the elevator dropping slowly as this model of a hand actually printed straight from a CT scan is growing right in front of your eyes. So Tim, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to talk to us about what types of photopolymers exist and can be compatible with this process. So this process has really opened up the door for chemists. I mean, we can think about all kinds of new photochemistry that might be amenable to this type of stereolithographic process, but some of the real functional groups that come to mind immediately are the acrylates or methacrylates, the only difference being a single methyl group for the case of the methacrylate, and epoxies and vinyl ethers. Both epoxies and vinyl ethers are susceptible to a cationic polymerization. In the case of the epoxide, it's a ring opening reaction. In the case of the vinyl ether, it's addition across the double bond. So these reactions are well established. We can generate photo initiators that are susceptible to radiation with light and generate radicals, or we can generate cationic precursors. Again, exposure to light generates a cationic species, maybe a strong acid, that opens up these epoxides or induces cationic polymerization. 
So there's many examples currently that people are looking at. They place these functional groups either in linear or cyclic polymers, maybe aromatic polymers. Of course, you have to be concerned about the aromatic ring absorbing some of the energy that's used. But polyurethanes and ureas, Chris and I are actually very active in this area, polyesters as well for biodegradable 3D printed parts by the microsterolithography, and polyethers, and again, polycarbonates. Really, the stereolithography process, from my viewpoint as a chemist, is really the most versatile technique, and it allows us to come up with new chemistries, new reaction methodologies that we can develop for any type of oligomeric or polymeric material, so long as it's a liquid and it's suitable for stereolithography. So one tool that Chris and I use routinely in our laboratories is, again, this rheometer. It looks a little bit like a cappuccino machine, but actually it's a very sophisticated rheometer available from TA Instruments. And this subtle change that we made to this is we adapted this rheometer to include a projection of light. That UV light is irradiated through a lower plate, an acrylic plate. And what that allows us to do is to ascertain how fast these reactions occur. And we do that by measuring that resistance to force as these two plates oscillate over a given gap. So typical data that we're going to see are G prime and G double prime. Again, these are fairly fundamental engineering properties of polymers, either storage or loss modulus versus time. And you can see that when the two black lines cross over, the dotted line and the solid line, using 20 milliwatts per squared centimeter of light versus a red curve, or the red solid line cross over the red dashed line, right, only using 5 milliwatts, immediately you can see that, hey, if you use more light, the reaction goes more quickly. But more importantly, this allows me to interact with engineers and tell them how much time is required to achieve a good curing reaction. And you can see these are fairly fast. The orange vertical line is where the light turns on. And then as a function of how much light we use, we can control the rate at which each layer grows in the stereolithographic process. So we have focused most recently on this family of thermoplastics, right? These are block copolymers where we have extended sequences of ethylene oxide or propylene oxide. These are often called non-ionic surfactants. They're used very widely in the drug delivery field. And, and what Chris and I hope to accomplish in this work was to decorate the chain ends with acrylate groups, 3D print them. And in these SEM or scanning electron microscope images, you can very nicely see, first off, the CAD design up in the upper left hand corner. You see the layer by layer structure, and then if we kind of expand through those windows in the side of that structure, right? You see very nice registry across the entire part, and you can see these layers that Chris has been alluding to in his previous slides with fairly well defined types of geometries. So, Chris, if you want to describe a little bit of what people are doing these days. Yeah, so commercially available resins are mainly in the acrylate or epoxy families. And actually, in the early days, the resins were all acrylates using free radical photoinitiation. So basically the benefits of that are of course faster reaction rate, but unfortunately have poor material properties. Now epoxies on the other hand is where they went next, which have a slower reaction rate but have better mechanical properties. So you have sort of have this trade-off. And what they currently offer now are essentially mixes of the two, of acrylate and an epoxy. That way you get sort of the best of both worlds. And when cured, they sort of have this inner penetrating polymer network which basically allows them to have both the benefits of acrylates and epoxies. And Tim's going to talk to us actually next about some new work that we're doing in ionic materials. Your imagination can really go wild on this, and this family of molecules called ionic liquids really is a well-suited class of materials for 3D printing. Why? Well, they're liquids, and they're not volatile. The ionic charge kind of suppresses volatility. It also imparts conductivity, so if you're very interested in 3D printing an ion conductive part. I know Chris and I have discussed a lot about electromechanical devices. How do we 3D print objects and with the application of a small amount of voltage actually make that object move because these molecules are charged. So ionic liquids, as you see in this circle, these monomers have melting points somewhere around 100 degrees C. And the one that we focused on is the very lowest one. This is a trifluoral sulfonyl imid octal phosphorus phosphonium cation. And that molecule has a nice low melting point and is a nice liquid readily susceptible to polymerization. Now how do we use it in a 3D printer? Right, take the ionic liquid, combine it with a cross-linking agent. So in this molecular structure you see a cross-linking point. You see the 10 on the side there. That's 10 repeating units of ethylene oxide. That's a dimethacrylate. That 
reactive cross-linking agents. So now we're making a thermostat, right? These are no longer thermoplastics. These molecules now, once reacted, are set. And no application of heat will change this molecular structure. You will not get this 3D printed object to flow. But what's important to note in these 3D printed objects is number one, look at the resolution on those peaks up next to that penny. We're very focused on small objects. Uh, these are mostly for biomedical applications. And you can see over on the left-hand side, those are actually 3D printed ion conductivity bars that we use in our impedance analyzer to make measurements. You see a hyperboloid in the middle there on the penny. And as Chris mentioned, there's our hokey bird over there on the right-hand side, beautifully optically clear, right? It has very good you know, kind of resolution and dimensional stability. If we kind of zoom in on that hyperboloid and look at that scanning electron microscope image in a little more detail, you can see that once again we get very well defined resolutions. Again, our goal has been to kind of print with resolutions around 25 microns. If you remember your biology, that's about the diameter of a cell, many types of cells. And that allows us to think about these materials as tissue scaffolds. And that's one of the areas Chris mentioned, printing organs. And that's an area that we're currently very excited about because the potential impact in the healthcare industry is really quite exciting. And once again, there's a scanning electron microscope image, actually two of them placed side by side. And you see the hokey bird printed. And Chris might tell you that's a fairly difficult structure to print. There's a lot of overhangs and other types of structures there that really are demanding in terms of the molecular structure and the chemistry that we use. And then finally, another example just to get you hopefully excited about stereolithography is the introduction of acrylate groups on the ends of polyesters. This again has a low glass transition temperature. We are focused on printing liquids. This is non-volatile, just like the ionic liquids. There's no vapor in the room. There's no odor. And that really is important in terms of a safety application. But our goal is to print cylindrical structures or tubular structures that are multifunctional, perfectly suited for 3D printing. This molecule is made uh, in the melt state, very clean, very pure, and we can 3D print this with very well-defined resolutions. Similar to an extrusion process, you know, there's advances being made in the materials development for this technique, not just making brand new chemistries, but also putting particulates into this to make a suspension that's printable. So one example of some work that we've done, we're actually embedding quantum dots into resin, it's actually to program that material to respond to UV light to get different responses after printing. Other work that's been done, an example, is printing suspensions of ceramics and printing suspensions of carbon nanotubes. Again, there are so many different types of technologies that can fabricate parts layer by layer, and Tim and I have gone through a great detail of extrusion and photopolymerization. We're going to quickly close out the presentation with brief discussions about powder bed fusion and binder jetting. So in powder bed fusion, what's happening is using a laser, using a CO2 laser, something in the infrared range, that's actually directly melting polymer powder, in this case a, a nylon material. And when we're working in a powder bed, and actually if we just go and start the video on the next slide, you'll see that what we have is a powder bed of material and a recoding unit that's spreading that material back and forth. You actually, if you look carefully, can see laser scanning the polymer and directly sort of melting it or fusing it. And there's a recoding process going back and forth. The, the elevator lowers, material gets spread across, and the melting happens again. In this case, we're drawing the next layer and making sure that it sticks or melts to the previous layer. It's a very messy process. The cleanup it takes quite a while to do, and we'll skip past that part because it's not as exciting as watching fusing happen. In terms of materials development here, it's mainly in the thermoplastic space. The biggest consideration is that we have to heat the material up to near its melting point, and then the energy from the laser gives it just enough energy to kick over that melting point to melt the polymer. Now, we can't go all the way back down to its crystallization temperature, again, due to concerns about shrinking and warping out of plane. So as a result, it actually keeps the powder around the molten polymer sort of above its crystallization temperature. And because of constraints of the actual engineering, the mechanisms of heating and thermal control and stability, we prefer polymers that have a wide temperature range between its crystallization temperature and its melting point. And there's lots of materials that are being developed, and instead of just polymers, we're also using higher energy sources to actually directly melt metals, like titanium. The final process we'll talk about is the one called binder jetting, which again is sort of like an inkjet printing platform, but in this case, instead of directly printing the polymer, we are actually printing a binder into the powder bed. So as you'll see there on the schematic and, and the animation that follows, we're jetting a binder that infiltrates into the powder and basically glues together powder particles. 
and you'll see that happening in the following video, where again in the inkjet, this is coming from X1 Technologies. So basically what's happening is a recoding process, and we're again jetting glue into that powder bed. And that powder can be any material. It can be polymers, it can be even sand for sand casting applications, and it can be metals and ceramics as well. After printing, you have to remove the part and then put it into a furnace or some other kind of epoxy infiltration to actually make the final part. And on the next slide, you actually see some sample materials that have been printed with that structure. Again, whether it's printing colored binder into starch to make color models or printing binder into metals or ceramics. And again, even printing in sand and then doing a metal casting operation to actually make metal parts. But really, the key takeaway from all these technologies, and really the sort of the, the fundamental message to you all from myself and Tim, is that the opportunities with additive manufacturing, with its layer-wise fabrication approach, allows you to tailor part geometry to get novel functionality. But as Tim will tell you, it's not just that, it's about making new materials as well. You know, I guess I'd like to reinforce that key takeaway is that one kind of motivating uh, force that we've had is that the materials of the past are not going to be the materials of the future. Right? For us to come up with new materials or new manufacturing protocols, that's what's going to be required to move this field forward more quickly. So thinking about reaction chemistries, doing reactions in layers, you know, with no byproducts, lots of click reactions, orthogonal syntheses are going to be needed to help advance the field. Understanding extrusion thermoplastics, their rheology, and their ability to kind of fit within all the exciting tools that Chris has described. So really the key takeaway from my perspective as a chemist is to print every molecule in your laboratory. Imagine printing that molecular structure no matter what you're making, whether it's a drug or it's a polymer. Think about how those molecules would respond in the 3D printing of the future. So with that, on behalf of Chris and I, we'd like to thank our sponsors. We have many sponsors in this area, including many companies that are not listed here. We want to thank them for their financial support. And we also have a host of collaborators on our campus as well as on other campuses here that I show both students and faculty at Virginia Tech. And with that, we'd like to thank you very much for your time, and we hope that you enjoy the world of 3D printing. We certainly have had a lot of great questions coming in. So let's kick off with a couple that I think are very specific to the presentation themselves. I think a couple of people ask about the printing of crystalline polymers. You had a slide that talked about crystalline, semi-crystalline, and amorphous polymers and didn't really talk about the challenges of printing crystalline polymers. Can, Tim, can you jump back to, to that thought for a second? Yeah, I'll be glad to, and I'm sure Chris wants to chime in too because he mentioned something about this as well. But, you know, semi-crystalline polymers often give you much superior mechanical properties. I mean, things like nylons. Chris, Chris mentioned polyamide 12 or a nylon 12 or possibly a nylon 6.6. What are the challenges? Well, the challenges are really to understand the crystallization rate that's why Chris maybe will comment more about you know, how he controls the temperature and turns that whole process. But again, you're operating that extrusion process well above the melting point of the polymer. But there's no reason, again, that we can't 3D print a wide range of semi-crystalline polymers. Chris, do you want to comment a little bit more on that warping and some of the other issues that you've seen? Yeah, sure. I think really what it boils down to is a few engineering challenges, basically getting real-time control over heating elements, whether that's heating an entire powder bed or heating a nozzle, and also controlling the heat transfer as we either deposit the material onto a substrate with convection and radiation happening or working in a powder bed where the same effects are happening. The reason why I mentioned a, high, a large processing window is really about control and actually having the models to understand how that can happen, and that's, that's a very important research topic in the field currently. Thanks. A bunch of questions kind of on both ends here. Recently at the Detroit Auto Show, they rolled out a Shelby Cobra that had been printed, and that's getting on the big side. So talk a little bit about what challenges exist on big, but also a bunch of questions around your work on the, the smallest resolutions that can really be obtained and where that's going to tap out. Can you address that, Tim and Chris? Sure, I'll, I'll start with the printed car. So that was actually done by some fellow Hokies at Oak Ridge National Lab, and also Lockheed Martin has recently displayed some similar techniques. And the biggest challenge in going large is, again, typically we need that controlled chamber to basically control the solidification rate, the cooling rate. And you cannot do that when you want to print large. So you've got to come up with a new polymer chemistry or some sort of new type of enforcing adhesion and bonding between layers that the layers don't delaminate in the midst of the printing. And that's really the biggest challenge there. Currently, what they're using is a fiber technique, and that's actually helping them with some of those challenges. I actually should mention that on a technology standpoint, the trade-off here is if I can print really small and get a high resolution, it makes 
the printing the large structure is really challenging. So it's very rare that you see a large shape with very fine resolution. On the small scale, we're looking at using light, right, and patterning light in very small spaces. That's what's sort of allowing us to get high resolution. Yeah, I'll just chime in, too, on that question. Right now, we're very interested in about the 25 micron resolution. And the reason for that is because we want to get close to the diameter of a cell, or a human cell, for example, or a bacterial cell. So to do that, our focus has been primarily around the 25 micron regime. As Chris mentioned, you know, we're trying to make parts that are on the order of about anywhere from two to eight millimeters in maybe height, for example. So under that dimension, we're able to achieve about 25 microns, and that seems to match what we hope to accomplish. There are ways to get smaller features. Uh, Chris, I don't know if you want to mention two-photon spectroscopy, right? But that's a tool that people are beginning to use, right, Chris? Yeah, essentially you're using two femtosecond lasers. The intersection of those two layers defines enough energy, provides enough energy to basically print or cure a solid voxel. So by moving the intersection point, you can actually start printing on the sub-micron scale. And that's also some emerging work that's happening. It's really exciting. Well, I think the, the other thing that people talk about is complexity of the parts. And I would be remiss given the questions that have come in both yesterday and today from the audience about not asking about printing food. It seems like maybe it's a college audience we have. They're interested in food. But people have asked about pizza, burgers, that kind of thing. What do you want to talk about on printing of food and also just this complexity of mixing materials? Well, I'll start by mentioning what we've currently seen. From an engineer, I guess it's been sort of surprising to see that interest, and it's great to see that interest. So NASA has recently actually awarded a proposal in looking at printing pizza, right, to get to feed astronauts in space, because Domino's does not deliver on the way to Mars. And essentially what the technology that's predominantly used in that space is an extrusion technique. We've seen some work out of Cornell where they're actually extruding like a turkey protein into a shape, into a gel, and then deep frying it. But even I've seen some other folks looking at this new synthetic meat protein where, again, printing, you actually could start printing a microstructure to provide the texture of meat. And I think that's what's really exciting. It's not just about combining materials selectively. It's also changing texture by patterning materials selectively. I'll just add a little bit to what Chris said, too. And then definitely you're going to influence how maybe how food tastes. You know, if it has a certain texture, the way it feels on your tongue, you know, may be influenced by how it's actually constructed. We might also think, too, a little bit about 3D printing of the packaging, right? So the whole packaging industry, right? This is a multi-billion dollar industry. How can we take advantage of 3D printing for packaging food differently, ensuring food safety, food quality, improving food distribution? These are all technologies that have really relied upon injection molding, blow molding, very conventional ways to manufacture so in the future, can we imagine 3D printing and what that might imagine or give to you in terms of foods and food packaging? Could be interesting. Again, going back to the issue of complexity, if you have two polymers that have very different properties, a polymer blend, if you will, that you want to make, is that going to be something you can 3D print? How do you do avoid things like phase separation in doing something like that? Maybe I'll start out, and Chris, you can chime in. I mean, as we know, you know, most polymers don't mix, right? They're immiscible. Even very closely chemically structured molecules don't mix. So you're right. I mean, controlling that phase morphology is going to be an issue, and it's, we know that the processing parameters are going to influence that morphology. I don't think that's yet to be determined. I mean, Chris talked a little bit about 3D printing composites, like putting an inorganic phase in an organic phase, and there's a lot of complexities. For example, how do you make sure that that mix is homogeneous and reproducible, and, and what's the morphology as a function of your process? Now, I think those are, you know, Chris, I don't know if you agree, I think those are research questions that people are looking at right now. Yeah, definitely. So the only commercial multi-material printer is on the market. It's called a polyjet system by Stratasys, and essentially it's a, that jetting of photopolymers I highlighted earlier. And there's a lot sort of unknown about exactly what's happening. We, we believe it to be an acrylate-based you know, photopolymer. We believe that the difference between the stiff and the flexible materials, you know, they might have a common backbone, but just different end groups. And they do some mixing, but it's not actual true mixing. They're sort of printing a droplet of white next to a droplet of black. And there's a roller in the print head that sort of smooths it out and provides some better interfaces. But there's still a lot of questions left to be remaining, even on this case where the, the, the polymers are so similar. And that's sort of one of the holy grails. Let's get multiple materials together. Maybe we have to wait for the nanoassembly unit. But until then, yeah, it's a great research topic. Along the lines of material, most of the things that you show aren't necessarily optically clear. Is it difficult to print materials that 
that we will be able to see through? Or is that is that an area that you can see solutions for, Tim? For sure. I mean, all amorphous polymers are going to have good optical properties. And the real complication that, you know, Chris and you want to mention more on this is really all the interfaces that are generated. So understanding how to control that interfacial structure and then almost like healing those interfaces, maybe in a second process. But the materials themselves give rise to very good optically clear polymers, like things like polycarbonate, polysol bone, those are beautiful lenses. So the challenge will be to try to understand this layer by layer approach and what impact would be on how light penetrates that structure. Okay, lots of questions coming in about the life cycle, recyclability, use of more sustainable materials. Can either of you address the issues of sustainability around 3D printing and is that going to be a plus or a minus for this technology? Maybe I'll start and Chris, you can chime in. Chris might talk about just the sustainability of the fact that you're doing additive versus subtractive. We're throwing less away. Remember an additive that you're only using the material that you need. So right off the bat, we're going to be using less energy and less material. That's sustainability. The other thing we might want to think about is if 3D printers are going to come into every home, how do we make sure that people in the home are using safe materials? And there's a lot of great, for instance, polyester chemistry where many of the feedstocks are based on bio-based triglycerides, for example, alcohols and carboxylic acids. Those polymers can be manufactured from bio-based materials. And an area of research that Chris and I have been talking about is how do we come up with bio-based 3D printing materials? That's really a very exciting opportunity. Chris, do you want yeah. to add to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is an important area for sure because a lot of the polymers that we're working with are you know, petroleum-based, and so their cost of them rises with the cost of a barrel of oil, and even the supply chain is quite limited currently. And there's also energy being put into just processing the material into a sh the raw form needed so that the printer can process it. But Tim is right. Just the idea that we're doing additive, we're only putting the material where we need it, as opposed to subtractive where all the scrap is on the floor. And so just that alone is something to pay attention to. I should mention that all of thermopolymers that we're using in the process can be, in theory, recycled, and there is very little waste in the printing, with the exception of the selective laser centering or powder bed fusion technique. That powder, as it sort of gets heated and reheated, even that powder that does not get solidified has a thermal history to it, and the material properties degrade. We do have some recycling issues only on that technique. You must have similar things on your photo catalyzed reactions too. Those are not simple thermal set type. Sure, thermal. yeah, the, the parts them, the parts themselves cannot be recycled. I'm just talking about the there's no material waste, right? So, okay. um, so there's no yeah in that process, no materials thrown in the trash. But again, I, I was going to chime in and say, you know, if we imagine like a 3D printed part that actually has cross links that are labile or triggerable, you know, again, I think this is where the chemist comes in. Can we 3D print things that, hey, I could throw them into a salt water and have them dissociate and become usable again? I think the answer in the future is yes. We just need to marry the chemistry with the engineering. Very good. Several questions coming in about conjugated polymers, other types of ways that you would impart conductivity to these materials. Can you talk about the, the implications of those types of things, printed electronics? I guess that's probably more to Tim. Well, I mean, I know Chris is doing this in his lab right now, but I'll start out a little bit. Most of the work that we've been doing right now are in ion conducting materials. So those, as we saw, have very good conductivity. In fact, the conductivities are equal to a, basically a solution cast coating. So we're looking mostly at conductivity with ion movement and looking at ion transport. But also electrons we know is important. And Chris, you might want to talk about your you know, various composites for conducting materials. Yeah, one of our dreams is to be able to print a circuit into a part as it's being printed so that in one single machine we have a mechatronic device, a device that actually knows about itself, it can sense or can carry power. So usually the solutions for that currently are suspensions with nanoparticles of metal, you know, silver, for example. There are a few other carbon techniques, but they really don't have the conductivity that we need. And there's also some metal organic uh, solvent kind of techniques uh, where actually through evaporation can get some metal deposits. The challenge, of course, is that these all need some sort of high temperature to center those nanoparticles together to get good electron transfer. And of course, when we're working in plastic substrates, that's a challenge. We wish we could sort of load those suspensions up highly, but then we hit reality constraints. 
Yeah, we're getting close to our time here, so I think we'll probably have time for just a couple of questions here. But one of the things that several people ask about was cycle time, and is your dream that 3D printing is a complete replacement for other types of manufacturing, or is there always going to be a coexistence of what we call conventional things today? Will the cycle time in 3D printing ever get low enough that it will compete with injection molding? I'll say that I hope to be wrong, but I don't believe that it will, and I don't think that's the point of the research in that space. So injection molding, we're injecting an entire part at once, high velocity and quick solidification. With additive, inherently, because of the physics of we have to process this in a layer-wise fashion, we just won't be able to compete in that space. We do hope to reduce the cycle time, but yes, I believe that additive is a tool, a very important tool in the toolbox of manufacturing. Okay. Your slides had a couple of references to, to things like Invisalign, but uh, several people have asked about true medical applications, if you will, printing organs or scaffolding for bones or things like that. Can you comment on where you think that trajectory is headed? Chris, do you want to take a shot? Sure, yeah. So we've seen a lot, obviously, at the beginning of the presentation, we talked about the examples and prosthetics and things like this. There's some, you know, peak and peck materials that are coming out that can be used for implants. And, of course, all the titanium that's being printed can be already and has been implanted in the body for hip and, and knee replacement. And there's some great work coming out of companies like Organovo where they're actually printing organs and work like Tony Atulla at uh, Wake Forest where, you know, printing bladders for actually organ or tissue replacement. And I think that is really one of the most fruitful areas of application for additive, being able to tailor an organ or a tissue or even a drug specifically to the patient, and that works perfectly for the economics and speed of additive manufacturing. I think now we're rapidly approaching our time. Can we get final thoughts, I guess, first from you, Tim, and then from you, Chris? I will, again, thanks, everybody, for participating today. What's my final thought? Well, I guess my final thought is a challenge. I think as chemists, we need to look at molecules as a way to be 3D printed. We need to immediately think about those as we develop them, and we I have to assume that the, the materials that we need in the future won't be the materials of the past. I've said that before. I, I think that's really my take-home message, and to understand the demands of the engineering on the molecular structures that we make. But I'm convinced that the future is a new materials catalog for additive manufacturing. Yeah, just to sort of echo that, I think there's a significant opportunity here to really change the way we think about product design and realization by concurrently designing the molecule the product geometry and the manufacturing process from the beginning all together. Tim says it's a challenge. To me, it's an invitation. As a person in the field of additive manufacturing, we need you. We need ACS members to get engaged and really help us open up the portfolio of materials that we can print. All right. Well, on that note, we got. I got to ask then. What What is your biggest wish? You, you got a bunch of chemists online, almost a thousand of them. What do you want them to go do? What's the material you need? Whatever molecule they're making, give it a shot in a 3D printer. I mean, we talked about printing chocolate or printing candies or printing food. Those are small molecules. Can we print drugs and make them more bioavailable or change their efficacy in the human body? So I'd like you guys to go out there and think about the molecules you're making and imagine them being 3D printed into 25, at least 25 micron resolutions and try to imagine what that geometry that Chris talks about will do for you in terms of your products. How about you, Chris? Oh, the list is too long. I'll say that what I want is folks to help us with the understanding of how these molecules interact as we process them. Ideally, we'd love to have either printing the molecule directly or printing molecules that are completely dissimilar and looking at how they come together to make multi-material, multi-functional products. Thank you for watching this presentation. ACS Webinars is provided as a service of the American Chemical Society as your chemistry source for live weekly discussions and presentations that connect you with subject matter experts and global thought leaders concerning today's relevant professional issues in the chemical sciences, management, and business.